do that in a lot of different capacities. Uh, one of the missionaries we support is Tyron Paul, who works with the SAEM in South Africa. I wished I could... The word missionary doesn't do it justice. This man is a brother to me, and he has a very strong anointing upon his life. And I know that God has given him a word for this church today. He'll be back tonight. We'll be taking up a love offering. I'm telling you, you're not here by accident. God is going to do something tremendous in this place today. I encourage you, let your heart knit with this man. He carries a real strong anointing of the Holy Spirit. So let's just pray. Father, as we enter into this time of your word, Lord, I know that this day has been ordained by you. Lord, I know that there's broken hearts here today that are going to be mended. I know there's lives that are going to be changed because of your word. The gospel does not come back void. Lord, so we silence ourselves this morning and we prepare our hearts for your word. And I thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Make welcome Brother Tyron Paul as he comes and he brings the word this morning. I think so. Okay, good. I love you. You too. Thank you. Well, praise the Lord. It's, it's good to be here this morning. And uh, it's good to also dress like this, you know kind of just relax and loose and uh, just to come and experience his presence. Um, I'm just going to take two minutes and then just announce these books that I have. It's by David and Donna Haig, our spiritual parents in, the, in South Africa, and the SAEM, South African Evangelistic Mission, turned 60 years this year. And we planted churches through Rick Lindenen, uh, CDC programs. We had 19 church planters and planted 24 churches. And uh, we had a break of about five years uh, because of finances, but we are hoping to start off the next program. And therefore, we have got these books that have been written by uh, Pastor Haig's daughter. Uh, it's called Sipo and the Sunbird. It's a story of hope for an AIDS orphan. And, and that's all, all proceeds from this go towards the church planting program. It's, we're asking for a, a donation of $10. And this one is by David Haig and Donna Haig for 50 years that they've been in South Africa. All the life stories in a devotional form uh, that can be contained in this book, and it's really inspiring. Some of the stories are related to people in Africa. My son, one of the stories is here about uh, his growing up as well. So uh, donation basis at the back, if you could please, no pressure. But every cent that you give will go towards uh, our furthering of the church planning programs in South Africa. So God bless you for that. Uh, I want to thank God for this wonderful opportunity to be here. I know that uh, somebody said, if you see a turtle on the fence post, you know it did not get there by itself. And uh, that is so true when I begin to realize that uh, I am here at uh, Christian Fellowship today. I remember coming f uh, many, many years to the mission conferences, and many of you served us uh, very good meals. We spent some good time here, and uh, this place was, was jam-packed with, with missionaries from all around the world, and I was one of them. And I thank God for the investment that you've made in my life. I'd like to salute and greet um, uh, uh, grandfather, grandmother, J.T. Parrish and his wife, and thank God for their, their, their input into my life. Also, uh, Rick Lindenen, my spiritual dad, who's not here, and uh, mom. And uh, also, uh, Brother David, good to see you here. You've played a part in my life, being in South Africa as well. And I'm just so, so uh, thankful to God for others who also came, like Wes and J uh, Justin and so many others that have been in Africa. So you know that uh, the work we're doing is authentic and all praise and all honor and all glory. We rightfully divert it back to God. Um, but I'm just so glad to be, be here with, with Richie and Jenny. And uh, I'm so, so glad that, that God has placed you in this church as a senior leader, and I give you the highest respect and honor. And, um, you know, I was just telling him, I said, a few years ago, uh, we were the up-and-coming ministers. I said, today we are legends. <laughs> 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 um, it's amazing to realize that we have such responsibilities, and God has entrusted that to us. And uh, I see a lot of white, white heads here today, 
and we want to make sure that we honor you. And uh, in no way would we want to take the, 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 the bright lights and the, and the big titles. Somebody said, you have 100 churches in South Africa that you oversee. And I said, yes, it was given to me on the basis of trust. And that is an awesome responsibility. Uh, David Haig wears literally a size 14 and a half shoe, and I'm only a seven. And when I said to him, I can't wear your shoes, he said something profound. He said, son, wear your own. And that is why today you'll never dress like this, but we still get on like a house on fire. Amen. So I thank God for the opportunity. I want to say up front that I love you. Because some of the things that I'm going to say may offend you. But if you're going to be offended, then take it up with God. Because it's His word. Amen. And I'm only the messenger, so don't kill the messenger. I'm here to deliver the word that I believe God has put in my heart. So uh, apply it to ourselves. And I think so many times when we hear it's for her or for him. But, but I want us to personalize it this morning. Because even though I'm delivering the word, I ask the Lord, what do you have in store for me this morning? Because the word is a two-edged sword. While I'm speaking to you, I have to speak to my own life first. So I thank God for this opportunity. Let's just begin to pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, I am humbled to take this platform today and to speak to your people. I do it, Lord, with great fear and trembling. I realize, Lord, that this is serious stuff. I realize, Lord, to be able to come and listen to what you have to say and use me, Lord, as a channel to speak to your people, Lord, is humbling in itself. So this morning, Lord, I pray that you would speak to me and through me. And you will also speak to your people, Lord, that we will not just be touched, but we'll be changed. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Um, that's my family. Tafton is now uh, 14 years, going to be 14 years this year. I won't tell you how old my wife is. She doesn't like me to say that. Uh, but uh, we've been married for 17 years, and she looks so good because I take good care of her. <laughs> and I also need a good background because I'm the dark one, dark and handsome one. But, uh, so I definitely need to use her and all that when I start off. So I'm uh, starting on a good foot. All right, so she sends her regards, Roseanne, and we thank God for his blessings, these 17 years that he's kept us married, faithful, and being able to do what God has called us to do. So I bring greetings on behalf of my family and all the friends back in South Africa. Amen. And I would like to thank also the church for your support. Thank you for your financial support. Thank you for your prayer support. And even though I haven't been here for two years, we can still get back and there's still a connection. That can only cov be covenant relationships. Amen. So God bless you. I want to speak this morning on taking back your position. Now position has caused a lot of problems. In the world. Not only in the world, but in the church. Because so many times we find that some people and a lot of people will not do anything unless they're given a title. Alright? If you don't take away the title, then they, be, they blow up like a bullfrog and then they walk out of church. They get so offended, they are so touchy, and yet they're supposed to be serving the Lord for many, many years. So position has caused a lot of problems in the church. In fact, churches have split. People have literally ended up in fist fights. People have stolen buildings from other people that were rightful owners. A lot of things have gone on in the church. But I believe today that when we come to a place, and I don't want to speak about position in the church, as much as there's so many positions that are needed, uh, I believe that there is a position that is not taken up. There is a vacancy in one area. And that is a vacancy in the home. And I believe that unless we take our place, somebody is going to fill that vacuum. Unless we rise to the occasion and take our rightful place, we're going to lose a very important God-ordained position. And I believe in God's order. And I, I've just come back from Bulgaria. I was there with Ed Huey. If you don't know Ed Huey, he was working with Dale Yerton. And we were there I had to fly through Bulgaria and teach in four gypsy camps uh, to people that are living in the ghettos of, of Bulgaria. And as I began to go there and begin to speak to them, I realized it's a totally different culture. For one, I hate cheese and yogurt, Bulgarian style. I just had enough, just like how you would hate curry when you come to South Africa. 
is we'll set you on fire so the world could watch you burn. But when I, was, when, I, when I went to Bulgaria, I couldn't adapt to the culture. The culture of eating yogurt that does not even taste like strawberry or granadella. It's just, poof, it was horrible. And when I got up to start teaching, I realized that there was a cultural difference. And now when I'm going to start to share the word of God this morning, I am South African, you are American, and there could be other people from a different culture here. But... We all love Jesus culture. Amen. Amen. Because the thing that connects us against the color of our skin, and I know you're battling with my accent, it's okay because I battle with yours. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. When we come to the Lord, we are now on a different platform. It doesn't make me South African or Bulgarian or American. It makes us come into line and the basis of our walk with God is all based on His word. He has exalted his word above his name. Heaven and earth will pass away. We love heaven. We think that's the, the utopia, the climax. But there's something above heaven and that's his word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. So this morning, my basis of what I'm going to say is not based on South African culture. It's not based on the American culture. It's not based on the European culture. It's based on the word of God. And if it's in the word of God, then we can't dispute that. Because then we are fighting with God. And I don't want to be fighting with God. So I want to say to you this morning, the basis of what I'm going to say, as far as you taking your position, and I'm taking my position, has to be in line with his word. Hallelujah. And that is the basis I want to speak about this morning. Let's turn to the word. And uh, forgive me, I try to cram everything. I know this is not a good PowerPoint, but I'm, gonna, I'm saying it to stress something. In the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. Okay? All right, that's, that's okay. For those who have got glasses, just ask your neighbor to read it to you. <laughs> Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. And I'm going to read, I want you to catch the, one, the words that are kind of sticking out there, all right? Ruth 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of the judges, uh, when the judges ruled, that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Marlon or Kylion or Chilion. Whatever you like to pronounce it. Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Verse 3, and Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left of her two sons. And they took them wives of the woman of Moab, and the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Marlon and Kylion died, also both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Now, I want you to see that these five verses in the book of Ruth, when I read it, I see that these verses are loaded with information. It's loaded with information. It is not a parable because it's given you exact, is an exact story. It's giving you the names of people. It's telling you about a man called Elimelech, the father. The mother's name was Naomi. She had two sons, Marlon and Chilion or Kylion. And they were living in a place called Bethlehem. But something happened in Bethlehem where there was a famine. And the moment the famine hit, you find that they decided to just take a short trip to a place called Moab. But if you look at the verses, it says they went to check it out. They just went to sojourn. It was supposed to be a weekend trip probably or a week trip just to go and check it out. But after time went by, they started to continue there. And before they knew it, 10, year, 10 years had gone by in this process. Now when you look at the story, you find that Bethlehem means house of bread. And Judah means praise. So right in Bethlehem, Judah, look at how ironic it is. In Bethlehem, Judah, there's a famine. 
In Bethlehem, there's no bread and there's no praise. Now, some of you have been taught wrong, like I have been taught wrong when I gave my heart to Jesus. They said, the moment you come to Jesus Christ, all is going to go well. Come to church. That's a fake story of the century. Oh, you're going through marital problems? Brother, come to church. Boom, we'll, we'll raise them, wave the magic wand over you. Boom, sakara sim, and you'll be... Come to church, you need money, hey, God's going to bless you. And then we start living lies and we start quoting religious jargon. I am blessed, but I don't have money. And we start psyching ourselves up. Now, I'm, please, uh, you, you'll get what I'm saying. I, am, I don't believe in confessing failure and saying I'm going to die, I'm sick, I don't have money. Uh, uh, that, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we need to be real. I'm saying that when we come to church, we're going to have problems. But when you're going through problems, you're not alone. Hallelujah. He said, I will be with you. Hallelujah. When you're going through storms, He's going to be with you. When you're going through hell, somebody said, keep walking. Don't stop. Walk through your hell. Hallelujah. Because the best is yet to come. So I want to say that when we come to church, we're going to have to be aware that the devil is after us. You're going to have to be aware that you are a moving target. He wants your marriage to fail. He wants you to be broke. He wants you to be demoralized and broken down. He wants to do that. But we have a hope. Hallelujah. God is with us. Hallelujah. We can overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Right here in Bethlehem, Judah. And I want to say even in the church. Even no matter how many times you come to church. No matter how, how much you pray. You're faithful in your giving of your tithes. You're going to go through times of famine. You're going to go through times where there's going to be no bread in Bethlehem. Does it mean that God is not the provider? He still is. Does it mean that you can't praise God? Yes, there's difficult times. Sometimes it's hard to praise when things go wrong. So right here in Bethlehem, Judah, there was no praise and there was no bread. If you look at the story, you find that when the famine came, it was a defining time in the life of Elimelech and his family. They had to go through hard times to test what they were made of. Sometimes God puts us through tests and trials so that he can prove what we really worth. Are we made of gold, silver, precious stones? Or are we, are we made of wood, hay or stubble? And sometimes God puts us through those trials so that we could be able to withstand the test of time. In fact, if you look at Elimelech, his name means, My God is King. Elimelech means my God is king. Naomi means pleasant and I'll talk about that more. Marlin means sickness and Kyleon means pining. Well, we'll come back to that. You prove your worth by how you are able to stick through hard times. Hallelujah. When things go wrong in your life and difficulties come, you're going to have to be able to have that anointing of stickability. Stick it out. But you find that the moment the storm came and hit Elimelech's family, hit Bethlehem, there was no food. He decides to take his entire, uproot his family and decides to go to a land called Moab. It is amazing that Bethlehem was house of bread, but there was no bread. Jesus comes many years later, and you find that Jesus is born in Bethlehem. When Jesus is born in Bethlehem, Jesus is not only just the one born in Bethlehem, but he's, who gives bread, but he said, I am the living bread. He who eats of me will never go hungry. Like he said to the lady at the well, he who thirsts will thirst no more. She came with a water pot. She left the water pot and she went away because she said he gave me living water that I would thirst no more. Are you with me this morning? God was dis disciplining Elimelech. But when the storms came, he decided to run away. He decided to pack up and go to Moab. When problems erupt at your home, when difficulties arise in the church, when hardships arise in your family, 
in your marriage and conflict with your children, then don't pack up and leave. You see, Christianity is not for weaklings. Christianity is not for any wishy-washy person walking through and said we're going to try it and see if it works and if it works then we're going to serve this God. If it doesn't work then we'd rather go back to the devil. I want to say your Christianity is weak. Show me somebody who's going through a tough time but yet they can raise their hand and worship God. I can say that man's got a backbone of steel. Show me a lady when all of hell is breaking loose and the whole church probably knows that your marriage is almost on the rocks but you can still come and you can still raise your hand and say in you I live and move and have my being. That's character. Hallelujah. Those are people that we need in the house of God. And even when things are going wrong, you can still stand and know your God. It's okay to praise God when everything's going well. It's okay to worship God when you get an increase. It's okay to be able to just have full of testimonies. But show me somebody who is going through storms but are still standing. That's character. Those are the people that God is looking for. Hallelujah. Some of the senior leaders here today are still staying strong, still holding on. Life has taken a, they've taken a beating from all sides. But they're still able to stand their ground. And they are examples to us. Why? Because they know what it is that God will see them through. They may not have the answer right now, but their trust is in the Lord. Notice what happens to Elimelech. If you read all those verses, it does not say at any given time that the moment the famine hit, Elimelech sought the face of the Lord. Now I believe this morning that we're going to have to be able in this day and age, we're going to need more men and women in the house and in the family who have discernment. I'm not talking about intelligence. There are a lot of people that are very smart. I know you're called smart Alex. <laughs> Sorry if your name is Alec. They are so smart. Intelligence. But they make some stupid mistakes. You know why? They lack the wisdom. That comes from the Lord. Oh, daily we say, Lord, give us wisdom. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. How we need that discernment to know what to do. We're going to have to hear God. Because uh, the world is fast changing. We can't keep up with it. Today you buy a computer, tomorrow it's obsolete. It's outdated. Today you got an iPhone, tomorrow they're making a new one. iPhones may be out of existence in the next five years. Out. It's very good now. We want it. 5S, yes, my thumbprint. Hey, magic, it's open up. No, don't even need a, 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 a number. But the world is changing. And how do we keep the pace when we have the spirit of discernment that comes from the Lord? We're going to have to have men and women who are going to have to hear from the Lord. He went down to Moab. When I look at other scriptures, I see that Samson went down to Timnath. Yeah, he goes down to Moab. I'm not going to read through all these verses. But why did God despise this move? Because he went down to a place God hated, disliked the Moabites. If you understand the story, it was because of Lot. All right, Lot had two daughters. And the two daughters, the elder one said to her sister, Listen, our father is here. And we think that we should have children with him. And she makes the father drunk and she goes and sleeps with him. Incest. She sleeps with her father. And she becomes pregnant. And then the next day the second daughter goes and sleeps with her father. Through incest. And she becomes pregnant. And the two children that were born out of Lot's daughters was Moab and Amnon. And that's how you got the tribe of the Moabites and the Ammonites. So he leaves Bethlehem, the house of bread. And that's found in the scriptures there on, in the book of Genesis chapter 19 from verse 30 to 38. You can read that up and you can, you can be able to study it on your own. They leave Bethlehem, the house of bread, where it's a house of praise because of some hardship. And he goes to the dirt bin of Moab and he starts to live out of the will of God, out of the plan of God. 
You know, when we disobey God and do our own thing, there's a price to pay. It may seem as if it's a short-term quick fix to our problem. And if we don't consult, you see, God, let, let me, are you following me this morning? You see, we are so wired in our thinking like this. We are strategists. We work things through our head rather than our heart. We got plan A. If plan A fails, we got plan B. Then we got plan C. C.1. Bullet point, point two. And then we go down the line and try all of these things like the lady with the issue of blood. When all else fails and we're almost dying and we can't even walk. Then we want to push our way through the crowd and say, if only I could touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. Why not do it when you got it all? Hallelujah. God help us. This, this is what he did. He went down with his entire family to Moab. To a place that God did not sanction. God hated the actions of the Moabites and the Ammonites. Throughout the scripture, he consistently makes note of that. Where am I going with this message? You see, when I was born, I was born male. When I fill out the customs form when I'm going into a country, they got a box, tick box. They say male or female. So I tick male. That's the way I was made, male. Some people don't know, but I tick male. <laughs> but there's a difference with being born a male and becoming a man. And then there's another step that is a step forward, which is not only a male, not only a man, but becoming a man of God. So in many, many homes, I find that Elimelech actually led his family down to a miserable place. I speak to you men this morning because I know what it is to be raised in a home where my father was a male, but he wasn't a man. Leave alone, he was not a man of God. He was an alcoholic. He was a drug addict. He only thought about himself. I would never forget culturally, my mother had to cook the food and she would bring a plate of food to, she, one day she brought a plate of food to give my father in his hand. He would sit there. He was sitting all drugged and he, he was couched on the sofa. And, and as she came with the food, he would put the plate into the wall and then he would start punching my mother in the face and she was a bloody mess. I rose up and tried to stop this, this argument and my father would push me aside. For years I would wrestle within myself thinking, am I adopted? Why is my father behaving like this? Is he my real father? I hated him. I said, when I grow old, I'll make sure my father pays for everything that he did to my mother. I'll make sure he crawls before me. That was my ambition. But miraculously, Jesus saved me. In that same year, my father... He lost his memory. He was sitting like a madman. He was crying. In one night, love came into my heart. The hatred vanished. I started to feed him. I started to clothe him, bathe him. Today, my father is a born-again believer. Amen. Something had to happen. Elimelech made a decision that was wrong. He moved his entire family you know where he moved them to? He moved them to the graveyard of Moab. 
That is why I'm saying to you as fathers and as, as leaders of your home, up and coming younger men, start desiring that you become a man and a man of God. Start asking God to give you his wisdom. Start asking God to give you his knowledge. Start sticking to the word. Start getting your life in order because you are leading somebody. In many, many homes, you, you can't have the wife as the leader. Yes, some wives are very smart with money. Some wives have, are, are very good administrators. Some wives are even more intelligent than some husbands. But do you know what? You are not the leader. I don't care how smart you are. This is not male chauvinism. Get that junk out of our head. Go to the word. This is not culture, African culture. This is the word of God. And God works through divine order. Hallelujah. The head is the man. The head above the man is Christ. The wife comes under the husband. And if you have accelerated because your husband is a bit slow, and sluggish, then I ask you to put reverse gear and move back to your place. Oh, what happened? Yeah, check the rearview mirror. Move back, move back, back off, back off because you are in a dangerous place where you shouldn't be. And help to push your man forward. Hallelujah! Help to push your you know, why many men don't do their they, they gone like dumb. They, they are men, but they've got no authority. Everything they must ask the wife for permission. Move your place. Start supporting because God's anointing will flow from the head down to the beard, down to the sandals. Then you'll see the blessings will come. How is it sometimes we're praising God and we're worshiping God, we want breakthroughs, but nothing is happening. It's because your house is in chaos. Oh my, I told you I love you. <laughs> Elimelech was the man, was a male, but he was not the man. He led his family to their death. Naomi meant pleasant, agreeable, sweet, but she becomes Mara. You know what Mara means? Bitter. How many men have made their wives bitter? How many leaders have made their children bitter? I was bitter. My father made me bitter. He made me angry. I saw that anger visit me even, even later years when I became a Christian and I was born again and I had my child. There was one day that I beat Tafton so badly. He was two years old. I beat him badly. And, the, and straight away I said, the demon of my father has visited me. Repented. Never again. Never again. We are role models. Our children want to be like us. Yes, they read their Bible, but they want to see the lifestyle portrayed. They want to see how we work. You know, so, some mothers cover up for their daughters. Almost to a point of compromise. They even lie for them. They'll send their daughters with another guy and tell the husband, no, no, she just went with their friends overnight. Lies! But you know what happens? It comes back to bite you. Stand your ground, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get the house back in order. Amen. Start reposition. Start realigning. Start getting things back in order. Because that's where God's blessing starts flowing. Yes, you may have certain abilities, but know your place. She goes back down to Mara. And I, I love Naomi. You know, the only thing we look up at Naomi, we tend to say that she's a bitter woman. Call me Mara. What made her bitter? She never ever, when you read the scripture, she never rose up and spoke bad against Elimelech as long as he was alive. Now some wives need to know how to...
because sometimes you don't know how to honor your husband. You don't know how to respect your husband. You gossip about him. You backbite about him. You tell your friends about him. You make him feel like a useless. She never did that. She knew how to honor him even though he made a wrong move. Two things the Bible says in the book of Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives. And he says, wives, submit to your husbands. The more you love her, the more she submits to you. The more you start showing her love. You know, I had a guy who died in my church, a wife, a lady who died in my church before I got here. Elderly gentleman. And he was a hard man. I mean, he'll be walking with his wife, he'll always walk far away from her. He's like a, you know, like a military man. He wasn't in the military, but he acts like that. Just talk to her, hey, come here. And when she died, the coffin came to the house. He wanted to in the house first and then take you to the church. And as the coffin came, he was wearing his suit and he was standing by the coffin and he says, Barbara, I want you to know today that I love you. Uh, you've been a wonderful darling wife to me. You look so beautiful in the coffin. I went and put her ashes in the sea in, in Durban with him. And as we came and sat in the car, he says, Pastor, I'd like to write notes to Barbara that she's dead. I said, stop doing it, man. What is wrong with you? Give flowers when they are alive. Oh, yes, but we know things are expensive. Forget it, man. Don't come and cry in the funeral and give big bouquets and put a big show and try and give all the wishes and say fancy speeches. For what? You had an opportunity, you missed it. Richie, I don't know about tonight, I may not be able to be ministering. <laughs> give flowers while they are alive. Your courtship has not ended, sir. What about the chocolates? What about the sweet kisses? What about holding your wife's hand? What about getting back the romance? What about showing that you love? What about expressing it? You're not macho when you don't show your love. You're not macho when you don't cry. God help us. Some of us need to be taken and shaken shaken up like a milkshake and say, wake up! Elimelech failed. His name was, my God is King. But he never ever demonstrated by his life. In fact, when Elimelech dies at the end, it's the end. Only when he dies, you find that Naomi now decides. You know, culturally, when somebody dies, you're not supposed to stand, you're not supposed to leave their graveyard and move elsewhere. In fact, your heritage has to be there. But Naomi stands one day and she said, I'm not going to stay here by the graveyard of my husband and two sons. She's now got two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and, and, and Ruth. And she says to them, go back, you know, the whole, the whole story. But she decides that her husband made a mistake many years ago and she decides to correct it without, without insulting him, even though he's dead. She never ever says that Elimelech was a bad man. Gosh, read that, read, read that scripture. She never runs him down. But she decides that she wants to go back to change direction from being down here in Moab to go back to Bethlehem even though people know that they left and they deserted their people to go and correct it. And who is she bringing back with her? She's bringing back a Moabite girl who was of a tribe that God disliked to the house of Bethlehem. You know what Ruth says? I love this. When Naomi says go back, Ruth says your God will be my God. Even though she was 10 years in Moab, she still saw the God dynamic in her mother-in-law. I'm fascinated. Mother-in-law and daughter-in-law got on like a house on fire. 
They loved, she loved them so much. She, she goes further and says, where you sleep, I will sleep. What you do, I will do. Your God. Who's your God? The God of Bethlehem, Judah. Hallelujah. Here's a Moabite girl who had lived 10 years with her mother-in-law. I don't know how long they were married. But who had lived with her and seen her lifestyle. She knew her place. Naomi knew her place. She never took over Elimelech's role. Only when he died, she now decides to take on the leadership and say, girl, we're going to go back home. Hallelujah. Mothers, your children are watching you. They're looking for a God dynamic in you. Have you lost your God dynamic? I remember I would get up in the morning sometimes after a weekend when my mother has gone through hell and high water. And I would, I would hear her in the morning covering her head with this duke. We call it the duke. And she'll be praying, Lord, save my husband, save Ben, save the boy, save my daughter, cover them under the blood. She'll be crying. And I would go up there and after she'd pray, I'd say, Mom, why are you wasting your time with that man? Why are you praying for him? He's an animal. She'd say, son, one day you'll come to Jesus. My mother went to be the Lord last year. But she stuck it through. She finished the course. She made sure that our entire family was saved. Today we all are serving the Lord because of her dedication. She took her place. She had the God dynamic. If she never stood, if my mother never stood her ground, I would not be in ministry today. I can tell you that. If she never stood her ground and prayed, even when I was a young boy, I was running away from God. I was angry. But I could hear in my ears, as much as I closed it, I would hear my mother's prayer, Lord, save Tyron, save Clive, save Michelle, save Ben. It stuck through, hallelujah. Mothers, take your place. If ever you want to be anything, be an intercessor in your home. Pray for your family. Pray if you don't know what to do, you don't know how to change your husband, how to, how to get things aligned. Start by praying, become a prayer warrior. Take your place, cover your home. With, God has put you there. Pray, 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 pray. Take your position. Children, take your position. You may have a lot of ideas. They may be good ideas, but they're not God ideas. Stop telling your parents what to do. You are only number three on the list. Father, mother, children. Not children above the parents sitting on their head. You are, more you are in more danger than anyone else because the Bible says if you don't honor your mother and father, you will die. Shorter than your lifespan. Am I preaching a false doctrine? No, word. Honor your mother and father that you might live long on the earth. Read it the other way. Dishonor them and you'll die short. If you dishonor them, disrespect them, disregard them, what they tell you, questioning, always questioning. I speak to children tonight, to this morning. Change. You want to honor God? It's not about how well you can worship, how much you can be involved in church work. It's how well you can honor your parents. There's been never a day, never a day after the Lord changed me that I came to a place of dishonor to my parents. The way I honor them, I honor mom and dad Haig. The way I honor them, I honor Rick and Debbie Clendenin. The way I honor them, I honor Dale, Dale Yetton and Evelyn. I honor them because these are people that God put in my life. And if I can show honor there, I know God's going to extend my days. The younger ones need to know their place. Honor, honor, respect. Take, your, take the place. Take your place. If we get the house in order, we get the church in order. We get the church in order, we get the community in order. We get the community in order, we get the world in order. 
how can we expect to be effective in the world when our own home is broken down? How do we expect to have peace and unity in the church when our home is a war zone? It's a war zone. You know, some people want to get out of, house, out of the house. They look for things to get, to keep themselves busy. Some men don't want to go home because the moment they get home, they, they are like in a war. Same woman in church is worshipping God, bringing down heaven. But going back home, she's in a, another mood. She's speaking in tongues in church, but then she's speaking another language with her husband. Let's not be walking dead men, zombies. Let's not just have the title. When you have to start raising your voice and you all say, Don't you know who I'm at? I am? I'm the mother. Then you've got no voice. When the father has to come and say, I'm the father of the house, you will listen to me. Why do you have to say that? That means you've got no power. When you start raising your voice, Listen, daddy's talking now. Then you're useless. You lost it. Only God can do it. Hallelujah. When, when you walk into your house, they know daddy is there. When you're there, they know mommy is there. They, they know your authority. They know your level. Hallelujah. Because when you speak, you speak because God has placed you there. I say this because I love you. I say this because many, many families are now headed down to the graveyards of Moab. It's never too late to start now. It's never, never too late. In fact, after today's meeting, you need to go back home and start doing a stock take of your family, of yourself. And start making some changes and say, God, I want this home to be a lighthouse. Lord, I want your blessings. How good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. For there. <laughs> take it to your home. For there. I want a there moment in my house. You command your blessings. Even life evermore. But if your house is smelling like a mortuary, you see the difference between staying in a house and in a home. I don't care how much of money you spend on built-in cupboards. Ladies, granite top. But if your house is only a place you can stay in any hotel, it's cold. I stay in a lot of hotels. I know how cold it is. When I get jet lag, the first thing I'm doing is I'm getting my wife up <laughs> in South Africa. What are you up to, darling? <laughs> Cold, yeah. <laughs> Lonely, yeah. I want to come home. Why do men have to go and have an affair? Because they don't want to be home. It's, it's not home, it's a house. We try to figure out why. Why, why a husband doesn't want to come home? He'd rather work overtime, he'd rather travel. Because there's nothing to come home to. Are you hearing me? White children don't want to, have a, don't want to go anywhere with you. They want to go do their own thing. Because they don't feel at home. God help us. God help us. I want to be at home, man. I want to feel somebody hug me. Somebody love me. I want to know I'm home. I know my place. Sometimes you can make a decision, lady, but say, you know, this one I could have to consult with the highest authority of the house, Dad. I, I think you should go, but let's get his final say on it. You know what that does to the man? You, you just escalated it to the right desk. You could make the decision, carte blanche. Make it. But you need to know where to put your circuit breakers. Have some circuit breakers. Don't go over your point where you shouldn't go. Because then you violate the order of God. Okay, um, what's my time? Okay. I'm done. I can't even see now. He cleaned in his ear, anointing upon me. <laughs> Ruth chapter 4, 
The story ends good and I'm closing. You know, even though there's bad family decisions, Ruth changed the whole course of history. When a woman decides to become a godly woman, she can correct anything. Are you hearing me? I sit in counseling sessions, they say, he's like this, she's like this, he's like this, she's like this. Stop. Start doing this. How can I be a better man? How can I be a better woman? How can I be a better child? When she decides to move back, God visits them. And the Bible says that Boaz comes and he marries Ruth. And when you read the book of Matthew in the genealogies, you find that Ruth, a Moabite, born out of the tribe of, e of an incest group, becomes part of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. When you look at Boaz, it's just, just you go and do some research. You look at Boaz. Boaz, his mother was Rahab the harlot. It's part of the bloodline of Jesus Christ who was a Jew. When you look at the way Boaz reacted, Boaz, his mother, was a prostitute. She had no example of how to be able to live with her husband. But Boaz didn't turn out like that. When you look at Boaz's character, he was a man of integrity. When she came in the night and she lied by his feet, covered his feet. He showed integrity. He became the kinsman redeemer. In the bloodline of Jesus Christ, you'll find Rahab the harlot's son, Boaz. And you'll find Ruth, a Moabite girl born out of, born out of incest because of a woman who came out of bitterness. And the Bible says, and God visited her again. He restored bread and he restored praise. I love the way the story ends. But somebody had to make a move. You know, if she died in, in Moab, the story would have ended bad. But it ended good because somebody chose to obey God. I'm saying to you wives, husbands, take your place. Maybe the reason why your family is the way it is is because you've said nothing. Things have gone wrong, you've let it go wrong. Take your place. Call a family meeting. Put on the agenda order. The buck stops here today. Call your house to order. Wives, you've taken a role that has been not your role, hand it over. Children, you've taken a role that's not been your role, take your place. And I can guarantee you, based on the word of God, not because I'm coming from South Africa to tell you this, Based on the word of God, you will flourish like the cedars of Lebanon. And you will have, for there, he'll command his blessing. I preach to you, I preach to me. And we say, Lord, let your will be done. Visit us, Lord. America is dying, South Africa is dying, the world is dying. Simply because we have violated God's order of the family. We ask him to take his place in our lives while we take our place in our homes. I'm going to hand over to Pastor Richie. Thank you.